All right, thank you so much uh, for coming today. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, dialect in Harper's novel, Isla Leroy. I wanna introduce the people here. We'll have a kind of round table discussion in which everyone will say a little bit about our approaches to teaching and talking about this text. And then we'll open it up to a larger discussion. So Eric Gardner is a professor of English at Saginaw Valley State University. And he is the author of two prize-winning monographs, Unexpected Places, Relocating 19th Century African-American Literature and Black Print Unbound, The Christian Recorder, African-American Literature and Periodical Culture. He has also edited five books, including most recently, the volume on reconstruction for Cambridge's African-American Literature in Transition series. His current book project supported in 2021 with an NEH fellowship focuses on Francis Ellen Watkins Harper's life and work during the Civil War and Reconstruction. Jennifer James is Associate Professor at George Washington University and author of A Freedom Bought with Blood, African-American War Literature, the Civil War to World War II. She is currently uh, at work on two books, Captive Ecologies, The Environmental Afterlives of Slavery, explores the ways the material and existential conditions of Blackness have shaped African-American environmental writing, and Black Jack, Andrew Jackson and Black Cultural Memory. Her previous work has appeared in a range of venues, including American Literary History, American Literature, the African-American Review, Feminist Studies, and Milas. Other essays have appeared in collections such as Environmental Criticism for the 21st Century, Feminist Disability Studies, Fighting Words and Images Representing War Across the Disciplines and Keywords in African American Studies. Derek R. Spires is Associate Professor of Literatures in English and Affiliate Faculty in American Studies, Visual Studies and Media Studies at Cornell University. He specializes in early African American and American print culture, citizenship studies, and African American intellectual history. His first book, The Practice of Citizenship, Black Politics and Print Culture in the Early United States from University of Pennsylvania Press in 2019, won the Modern Language Association Prize for First Book and the Bibliography Graphical Society St. Louis Mercantile Library Prize. His work on early African-American politics and print culture appears or is forthcoming in African-American Review, American Literary History, and edited collections on early African-American print culture, time in American literature, and the colored conventions movement. Spire's work has been supported by fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Social Science Research Council, and the Mellon Mays Initiatives. Richard Yarbrough, is Professor of English and African American Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. His work focuses on race representation in American culture, and he has written on authors such as Frederick Douglass, Pauline Hopkins, Charles Chestnut, and Richard Wright. He is the Associate General Editor of the Heath Anthology of American Literature, as well as the former director of the University Press of New England's Library of Black Literature series. In 2012, he was given the American Studies Association's inaugural Richard A. Yarborough Award in Mentoring, which is named in his honor. He is also the 2016 recipient of the Darwin T. Turner Distinguished Scholar Award presented by the African American Literature and Culture Society. Most recently, he has published essays on Ernest Gaines, James Carruthers, and mm. Jimi Hendrix. In 2019, W.W. W. Norton issued Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Jacobs that he co-edited with Francis Smith Foster. And I am Bridget Fielder. I'm an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm the author of Relative Races, Genealogies of Interracial Kinship in 19th Century America from Duke University Press in 2020 and co-editor of Against the Sharp White Background, Infrastructures of African-American Print from the University of Wisconsin Press in 2019. My work has been published in journals such as American Quarterly, Legacy, a Journal of American Women Writers, American Literary History, and Tulsa Studies in Women's Literature, and in various edited collections. I'm currently working on a book about racialized human-animal relationships in the long 19th century, which shows how childhood studies becomes a key site for often simultaneous humanization and racialization. And other work in progress includes a project on early Black futures, which considers early black employments of old technology as a form of proto-Afrofuturism.
and in which attention to Black childhood becomes a project of deliberate and racially hopeful futuring. So I want to go ahead and start out our conversation by just pointing to a couple of things that I've found important when teaching dialect in African-American literature in Harper's Iola Leroy, for one, as a text that I teach quite often among a lot of Harper's other work, always among Harper's other work. One point that I always make at the beginning of my conversations about dialect in these classes is to point out to students that dialect is never just mimetic speech, but that marks speech apart from that of both white and black characters who speak standard English and work like Harper's and must therefore be thought of in terms of the additional work that marked speech is doing in addition to alluding to the RL. So when I teach Iola Leroy, I seldom teach it at the beginning of a class, but it's often rather late in the semester. And overwhelmingly, it's not my first introduction to dialect, which I more often treat in dramatic forms, sometimes in Black-based minstrelsy, but often in work by Black writers that's inspired by minstrelsy, like William Wells Brown's The Escape or A Leap for Freedom, or Pauline Hopkins' play The Peculiar Sam. And in those texts, thinking about our distance from works that were read aloud and for which we are already quite removed in reading editions of these things on paper, on the page, you know, re requires some attention to the aural and in a particular way. But I'm often really reluctant to do things like have students read these texts aloud. I teach at a very predominantly white institution. Even in my African-American studies classes, I might have predominantly white students. And when I started writing about minstrel versions of Shakespeare's Othello a long, long time ago, back in graduate school, as I started to read aloud quoting from the text that I was writing about, I became increasingly concerned about what that performance did and my reluctance to you know, think about performing that form of minstrelsy as I read aloud from those texts. And that's, you know, kind of come around to my treatment of Frances Harper. I have a book chapter uh, that discusses Iola Leroy and is alongside a number of other works. And in public talks, one of the things that I do quote directly from Iola Leroy is a scene that involves dialect. It's the scene in which people are at a camp meeting and a woman is talking about the event of her children being taken away from her. And I, I find myself when I read that text aloud, increasingly cognizant, not of the dialect and what it's doing. I, I kind of read it straight. I don't pay too much attention to trying to approximate whatever accent Harper may have intended to give this fictional person. But I am very interested in this very familiar scene of separation as it comes generically from slave narratives through to Black women's experiences. And I read this alongside an account of an information wanted ad published in the Christian Recorder, which I also read alongside this scene. You know, and for me, the, the deep, deep sadness of those scenes have kind of taken over for my thoughts about what's going on there in a way that has re reminded me that dialect speech is often associated with or staged for a uh, kind of comedic effect. And that this is decidedly not what Harper is doing in this text. And so there's you know, no way to, for me to really think about dialect as rendering this character ridiculous in this moment of you know, explaining what is essentially a moment of trauma. But I, I, I think also of that speech alongside all these other instances in which dialect marks characters in a particular way that my students, even in my classes, because of the other texts that I teach that do also include dialect, often attaches this to kind of comedic characters in interesting ways. And so that kind of disjoining is, is some of what I get to when I talk about what dialect is and isn't doing in Harper's text. We still see it doing some, uh, you know, interesting work to relay characters' access to certain kinds of education or class position, but it is very much pushing against, I think, you know, some of these other comedic moments in U.S. literature and, and even in African-American literature. And, you know, I, I want to ask my students to kind of think a, a little bit more carefully about, you know, what that work looks like 
in a text or in especially these moments, you know, where that speech is still kind of clearly marked as different from other characters' speech. But, uh, you know, the, the work that it's doing might also shift throughout the text as we, as we move forward and might do different things at different moments. And so that's just a little bit about, you know, what I start with as I, you know, introduce students to, you know, often reading African-American literature for the first time in the context of my classes and overwhelmingly reading early African-American literature for the first time in which they uh, might very well not be familiar with, you know, not just methods of, of Black speech and their representation, but, you know, also the various generic forms that, you know, these authors are playing with. And so I will turn it over next then to Professor Yarborough. Um, thank you very much. And I uh, really appreciate participating in this. And I look forward to hearing uh, what everyone um, thinks about this issue, which raises a lot of pedagogical challenges that have gotten more and more complex, it seems like, as time has gone by. So I will just try to hit sort of in a bullet point fashion some of the things that uh, I keep in mind or strategies that I employ when teaching at Old Roy. I teach it frequently and I generally teach it at the undergraduate level in an introductory course to early African-American literature from the beginning until uh, World War I. So as Professor Fielder mentioned, we encounter it late in the quarter, which I find to be really helpful. I begin that course with two or three weeks of looking at oral uh, material. I talk to them about different types of literacy, written literacy versus oral literacy. And we look at folk tales, song lyrics, uh, sermons, and the like. I also, without trying to be an expert, spend a little bit of time talking about the extent to which Africans brought languages and linguistic practices with them, and that there are a whole slew slew of words like jive and banana and gumbo, hullabaloo, lollygag that um, are directly from African speech uh, of languages and that have been absorbed into English, often unacknowledged. I then raise the issue of accents. I teach in Southern California and a lot of my students are either bilingual or they have friends or family members who are bilingual. And the issue of accents is really relevant for them. This is not unique to African-American culture and speech. And we talk about how society views certain accents as signs of, of uh, a lack of intelligence and certain accents as a sign of culture. And this type of discussion, I think, sets the table for them to be attuned to the way in which accents uh, do work in the text that we look at in terms of the representations of characters. Uh, almost all the students have trouble reading the dialect. I used to tell them, go off and read it out loud, go to the bathroom if you want to hide. And I still tell them that, but I know that that's not sufficient for them to come back and understand what's going on. So you know, I really spend time dissecting the typographical conventions that were established often by people from outside of the speech communities that are generating the materials so that they see that what's on the page is often something arbitrary and you know it is not meant to be or it, even if it is meant to be it is not an accurate reflection of what a given speaker might be actually saying or pronouncing um, so i just want them to be aware of that kind of distance and i even give them a key maybe like only five or six examples where i'll have my favorite is the g-w-i-n-e and i just write on page that equals going d-a-t equals t-h-a-t -T. i mean things that you know, if you've been working with the material for a long time, you take for granted that really stymies a lot of the students. So I, I, I want them to even think about almost like translating it. Yes, it's got some phonetic values that I want them to pick up, but in some cases it, it may not. Um, the other issue that I raised during this time is just to emphasize and maybe even give them examples using my own my own life, how very few of us pronounce the words as they are written on the page. In other words, all of us speak in dialect, all of us code switch, all of us use vernacular. And I just tried to, and if this is a term, a D exceptionalize some of what's going on in terms of the black speech on the page. In terms of handling the dialect materials in class, I never ask the students to read from those texts. I don't hesitate to read from them. And when I read from them, as um, Professor Fielder mentioned, 
I don't worry about rendering it exactly the way it is on the page. I am not going to try to figure out how G-W-I-N-E is pronounced. I will not read it as if it's conventional, but I, I just, again, I've just made the point that this is arbitrary rendering of speech, you know, attending to it with any kind of attempt at, 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 at specificity doesn't make any sense. I, I don't go much into this, but the idea of I dialect, E-Y-E dialect, is an old one, but it's really helpful to give the students a term that they can, you know, touch on so that it's, it's, a, it's part of a growing lexicon I hope they can develop. Final couple of things, during my discussion of Black folk speech, I talk a lot about vernacular, and I talk about inside community speech and outside community speech. And I frankly go right to racially charged terms and issues that come, that come up in the speech, most notably the word quote unquote nigger. And I, and I talk to the students directly about it. I tell them my personal experience with the term and I tell them what my practice in the classroom is. It's, it's sort of a, it, when I didn't do that, it would come up because I teach materials from Zerniel Hurston's Mills and Men where that term is there. And I, I want the students to know how I'm going to approach it. I also encourage them to watch a documentary called The N-Word, which is really, really helpful in terms of presenting it in a contemporary context that they can relate to. This inside and outside speech communities, I, uh, again, I want them to broaden it. I want them to think about how they and their ethnic or gender or sexual community may use language that isn't appropriate for someone from outside that community. So again, I just want to complicate their sense of what oral speech is. And then by the time the students get to Leroy, I really hope that they have a sense of the complexity of the issues. And I usually teach some of Harper's Aunt Chloe poems right before I go into Iola Leroy, because that's an early experimentation with a Black folk persona and with rendering Black folk speech, shifting from this really positively depicted uh, woman, Chloe, into folk figures like Aunt Linda and Jake is really, really productive. And it forecloses some of that knee-jerk, comic, uncomfortable reaction to the tortured speech as it shows up on the page. So uh, let me stop there. Those are some of the things that I, I try to think about as I'm teaching this, this amazing book. Thank you so much. And next we'll turn to Professor Spires. Yeah, thanks Bridget for bringing us all together. I think I'll pick up where Richard left off in thinking about inside, outside, different language communities because I'll often tell my students when I'm teaching Iola or other texts by Richard Wright or Hurston that are set in Southern spaces then filled with dialect that may or may not be authentic to the spoken language, but definitely does something visually on the page. I'll tell them I grew up in Mississippi. I went to like a gravel road Baptist church in the Delta. I grew up around a lot of different Englishes because my mother was a school teacher and she spoke a particular English and wanted me to speak that English. And yet I was also around cousins, uncles, grandparents, etc. And within one room, one family, one table, you get a panoply of English and we all know, love, respect each other. We all understand each other and we all speak our language. And I think one of the things I want students to understand from that story is not necessarily that because I grew up in Mississippi, I have some different sort of access to what Harper's doing. It's more of a bridge because I can then ask students how many different like Englishes are you speaking at home and how many languages are you speaking at home that aren't English or whatever they are, right? And think about trying to get that down on a page and why you'd want to get that range of languages down on a page and then apply that to Harper as someone who is trying to capture, if not necessarily the historical fact of the community, a historical sensibility of a community at a very sort of pivotal point in history, right? And she's trying to give us a sense of not just what this set of people, this set of characters are feeling, et cetera. She's trying to give us a flavor of that range, right? And so I start there. What is the project? Why would someone like Harper undertake this task? And I remind them, because when I teach Iola, they will have read other things from Harper up to this point. And at least once, when I taught Iola coming from the early 19th century forward, this was among the first 
pieces they'd read that had dialect in it in this way. Right? When you're reading early African-American literature, you don't see dialect a ton, at least not to what you see in say Coteo or Iola. And so to see it in Iola, especially if you're reading black newspapers, et cetera, can be really jarring. And so I asked, what is her project with this, right? And we spend some time thinking about, especially those first few pages where Iola teaches you really quickly not to confuse non-standard English use with intelligence or a lack of savvy. Right. It's almost intentional because Harper herself understands the way that Black language gets used for humor, minstrelsy, et cetera. And in some ways, she's setting readers up to approach the language in that way, only to flip it. Right. And so I warn students, she, it's a trap. Don't fall for the trap. Right. I will say, though, in terms of how I approach reading Harper and others, including Richard Wright or Hurston out loud, like Richard, rarely, I don't ask students to attempt to read this printed language out loud because that often leads to, I don't want to set students up to embarrass themselves or to do harm to other students in the space. So you never know what experiences other students are bringing. And so I won't ask them to read those passages out loud. I will read them out loud from time to time. If it's pedagogically useful, I, I never read a passage just because it sounds good. That doesn't seem, sometimes it's fun, but with this kind of material, I want to make sure that there's a very clear pedagogical goal. And I, will, I won't necessarily translate into standard English as I read, but I won't attempt to pronounce everything the way it's printed on the page. And again, I'm reinforcing to them that this is a language that isn't necessarily giving us direct access to how people would have sounded in that space at that time. Um, in moments when I want to give them access to something like that, I direct them to the WPA archives. There are recorded interviews with formerly enslaved people. And so if, you, if one of your goals is to ask, answer the question, how would someone have sounded in this moment, and that's one way to go, but I'd also sort of remind everyone here, and this is what Harper does within those first few pages, there's a range of Black speech happening on those pages. There's a range of Southern Black speech happening in those pages. So what we're dealing with is not just sort of racialized language, this class language is situated by region, is situated by education. I graduated from an HBCU. And so some of my first encounters with dialect language was in the context of all Black classrooms. And those are also really fraught spaces. And so this conversation around who can and who can't doesn't boil down to identity or sort of biography. It really is, a, it, if I don't drive anything else home in my bullet points here, the question I come back to is what is the pedagogical goal? Whose interest am I serving at any given moment and in any given lesson plan? And then, like I said, I teach a range of African-American literature and I've talked a little bit about Richard Wright and Zora Neale Hurston, who for good or ill, can fall back on the fact that they come from the communities they're representing in the literature. But even those two, Hurston Savage's Richard Wright, Hurston as the trained anthropologist for his language use, right? Harper is even more complicated because she's not from the places she's writing about necessarily. She's born in Maryland, but she spends the better part of her formative years and her adult life in the Northeast and the Midwest. And so the analogy for her is closer to someone like W.E.B. Du Bois, who is coming to the South as someone not of the South and learning and sort of making the faith effort to learn about the people, learn about the culture, et cetera. But that's important to remember lest we go to Iola Leroy and Harper as a kind of authority on Southern Blackness of a particular sort. And that gives me and my students a bit of a distance between what's on the page in Iola, which reminder is a novelization of a history and some sense that what we're getting is sort of a through line to something called an authentic black experience. And once we've gotten through that, 
then we're on the page talking about the literature, talking about some of the things that Richard brought up. What is Harper doing with the typography? What is Harper doing with the spelling? And why does she feel, what work does she feel that this accomplishes in this moment at the turn of the 20th century? So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over to Professor Gardner. I'll echo a lot of what Professor Fielder, Yarborough, and Spires have said. And I'll start by echoing the thanks to Professor Fielder for inviting uh, all of us to, to talk together here. I, I do actually rarely read dialect aloud when we're studying fiction, and I almost never ask my students to do so. Part of this is because I share Professor Fielder's sense that dialect is not a mimetic of speech. It's not just an allusion to the oral. And part in this vein is that I have to keep reminding that we're studying a graphic system that is made with and made on physical material objects. And part of my concern is that reading aloud puts my performance at the center when I'd much rather have the authors work there. But to get to that point and to recognize dialect in a complex web that includes the oral. We do in my courses pause and think about teachers and students reading together. And so as a kind of table setting move, I do shift to an explicit discussion of my choices about reading aloud. Uh, for example, I almost always tell students bluntly that I am bad at reading dialect. And I don't offer that as a disclaimer so much as I use it to start a set of discussions. I often ask my students why I or we might be bad at this and just what that might mean. Sometimes I get folks to consider that I'm a semi-rural mid white Midwesterner who's teaching at a university whose students are majority semi-rural white Midwesterners. And so often we talk through questions of expertise and recognize that we shouldn't assume that we can read dialect aloud accurately from what's on the page, not just because of the graphic elements, but because we have, but because having a specific type of alphabetic literacy doesn't mean that we have all of those literacies. And so we might make errors, not just in terms of pronunciation, but also in terms of inflection, pacing, volume, style, I, I could go on there. Regularly, we get to the common suggestion that dialects should be read with a Southern drawl, but we move pretty quickly to point out that a Southern drawl is a stereotypical construct. There are many Southern voices. They do not all sound the same, and they do not all drawl, whatever that means. Sometimes when they do, it's because they're trolling Northerners like me, who grew up hearing Southern speech represented in bad Warner Brothers cartoons, Carol Burnett parodies of things like Gone with the Wind. In these discussions, it's not uncommon for Black students to reflect on how they may have been actively discouraged from using vernacular speech in classrooms, or to reflect on how Harper's representation of dialect is very different from the variety, or Professor Spire's point is well taken, varieties of Black dialects that they've heard. Some say that they're bad at reading Harper's dialect too. Sometimes I'll get a student noting how some forms of contemporary Black dialects have been appropriated by white speakers or a student marking how comments on dialect can link race and class biases, or conflate certain kinds of speech with assumptions about education or intelligence. That is, they can reduce complex sociopolitical and linguistic issues to, those people talk funny, don't they? And minstrelsy often comes up in these moments too. And occasionally, if we haven't already said so in the course, a student will assert that minstrelsy often depends upon corrupt representations of dialect. And I mean corrupt not only in terms of the phonetics, but also corrupt in terms of the morality, the, the ethics behind dialect. And this all can get us to a place where it isn't just that we're bad at it, but where we're talking about how the soundscape of black dialect has been denied and dismissed or warped in white dominated public spheres. My goal in talking about withholding the performance of reading aloud um, are thus designed to emphasize the care that we need to take with language. Uh, and that's a broader thematic in all of my courses. Uh, and it's one that I think is uh, highlighted in Iola Leroy. And with that novel especially, I wanna push my students to think about Harper's naming in chapter one. It's in those first few pages that Professor Spires uh, referred to. And she talks about an invented phraseology. And I want my students thinking about how dialects themselves can function in that frame and invented phraseology when in print and when beyond print. I don't think that we have to read dialect aloud to carefully and deeply consider it. And in fact, I think sometimes reading it aloud gets in the way of doing those things. So I guess I'd describe my approach to considering how, when, and if to read aloud both Iola Leroy's dialect and dialect more generally as intentional and cautious and ultimately humble. Um, we always step back and ask just what the goals and consequences of that act of reading aloud are, 
what assumptions, practices, and systems might get in the way of doing it well, and what we might do that might move our discussions forward and what we might do that might push our discussions backward. And I've been uh, excited to hear uh, what folks have said in terms of the way they approach those questions too. I'm looking forward to Professor James's remarks and uh, to the conversation that follows. Thanks. Thanks so much. And Professor James, you're just on mute. Hi. So I want to thank everyone for your really great remarks on Iowa excuse me, and dialect, and to thank you, Bridget, for inviting me to be part of this conversation. I just have a few things to say. Most of them sort of reflect or reinforce a lot of what's been said already, except for I deviate in one important way, is that I do read dialect aloud constantly in my classrooms. I ask them to read it aloud. I also do what Professor Yarbrough was saying. I ask them to go into a corner if they feel really uncomfortable, like go hide in the bathroom and read it aloud because it really does help them understand often what's going on on the page. But I also want them to encounter the relationship between like what's on the page and what sounds come out and why we make the decisions about how things sound. As Derek was saying, and as I mentioned in our last conversation, the way in which we think about how Southern dialect sounds is influenced by the production, like in the 19th century, the typography, and we don't necessarily have access to it. And when you go to the WPA archives and, I, and listen to the way that former slaves sound, they often sound, as I mentioned last conversation, like they came from the Caribbean, which is completely different from the way in which we would imagine them sounding. And so when we read it aloud, and when I have them read it aloud, we collectively discuss why we're making particular decisions in that orality and like where it relates to what's actually on the page or where it comes from a soundscape that they might've had access to outside of the classroom in their own lives, you know, from their grandmothers, from television, from, you know, whatever kind of music they listen to, maybe Southern hip hop, where do you get that sound, right? And why do you think that that's authentic? I'm not really, worried about like the laughter that comes from the dialect or the laughter that comes when I'm stumbling over the dialect. I'm really bad at it, even though I had parents who were like raised by people, you know, who had Southern roots. I'm bad at it. And I don't know particularly why that is, but I am. Some of my students are better at it than I am. But I do think that it's really important for us to consider where we get our sounds from and then how we decide like what's authentic and what's not authentic. I like to have conversations about how we come to an agreement about how a word would sound, like W-G-I-N-E. Well, okay, well, you've read it this way, I've read it that way, you've read it that way. How do we decide, and, or, or can we decide? And I think that a lot of interesting and rich conversations can come out from the mistakes and from the comedy of reading it, not the comedy of the character on the page, right? We're not laughing at this character, but we're laughing at ourselves trying to learn a language, trying to understand a language in the same way that we laugh at ourselves when we're trying to understand and like speak French, right? And that kind of thing. It's a different, it's a different language. I want them to think about the definition, what their definition is of dialect and what associations they have with that word dialect, you know, whether it is classed whether it is race, you know, whether it has to do with education, the negative associations that often come with dialect. I was recently rereading Alice Walker's 1969 letter to Ernest Gaines about bloodlines in which she is saying, oh, you know, I don't, you know, I wasn't exactly sure like how we should write African-American speech. And, and she writes speech, not dialect. And she's really clear that she doesn't want us to call it dialect or she doesn't want to refer to African-American speech as dialect because it has been a denigrated form in some ways. And so, you know, I, I'm, I was all, I'm always surprised by that because I think we've recovered it since 1969, but that was really still in the early days of when, you know, African-American literature was entering into the academy in a more robust way. And I think that these conversations about legitimizing the literature were so fraught that I think that in some ways, as much as she is an appreciator of Southern life and, and Southern ways, that there was a danger that she associated in calling it dialect. So I want them to think about like what the word dialect means and their associations with it. 
where does their understanding of African-American vernacular English come from? And like, how do you know whether it's authentic? They have access to Twitter and social media. And on Twitter and social media, there's often a performance of African-American um, vernacular English in order to be sarcastic or wry or insightful. And it's being picked up really by a lot of white people. And I don't think that they're mocking it. What they're trying to do is enter into a way of seeing the world that they appreciate or that they think is sharper than standard English can allow them. I don't think it's always mocking, right? I think it's trying to participate in a kind of language and what that language can do. So we talk about what they think African-American vernacular English is. I have them do translations. So I'm, I'm interested in the class, you know, question. And so we'll take a look, for example, and I do this with, I've done it with Harper when I've taught Iola Leroy, but with Paul Lawrence Dunbar, I'll take a poem like philosophy, which is in, you know, dialect. And we can, you know, we can talk about whether that's actually real dialect or not, or, or real African-American vernacular English and sympathy and have them rewrite them or a Negro love song. That's the one I really love to do. So I have them take a Negro love song, jump back, honey, jump back. How would you translate that into standard English? How does that change who you think the speaker is? You know, what gets, you know, what gets lost in the translation that's there when you render it in vernacular speech? And so I think the act of translation is really interesting in that, in that context because it forces them to confront the, the English, not just for like what it sounds like, but for what it's doing, the, the, the dialect, what it's actually doing. And then what the standard English is attempting to do that can be deconstructed or remade in the dialect. So, so I do these kinds of messy things and I kind of like a messy classroom because I want to see what comes out of it, the kinds of surprises. And I want to make everybody feel comfortable with the literature. And I think the way you make them feel comfortable with it is just to just to, you know, take it on its own terms. I like to talk about Iola Leroy in terms of what I think is really radical what she and what she's doing with the dialect. I don't tend to think her dialect is great. I don't think it's particularly representing anything that is quote unquote authentic. I think um, like you're saying, Bridget, it's not mimetic. It's supposed to mark a certain kind of speech or uh, place in some way. But I, I lost my train of thought. But what was I saying? I lost my train of thought. I was saying that you were listening to me, right? So- Not necessarily mimetic, but- Right. Oh, but what she's what yeah. she's doing with it that I think is radical. I'll position it against what Zora Neale Hurston does in Their Eyes Are Watching God, right, which is supposed to be like the, the masterwork, you know, of African-American dialect and what Chestnut's doing, who's also, you know, supposed to be a quote unquote master of dialect. But in Chestnut and in Zora Neale Hurston, there is a frame. The standard English comes first. So we have the narrator for Their Eyes Are Watching God who enters in the scene and then we're, we move into the world where people are speaking dialect. Same with Charles Chestnut, right? He, does, he doesn't begin with dialect. What we have with Isla Leroy is we're plunged right into that speech, right? Between Robert Johnson and Tom Anderson. And so she begins there. And I think that's daring. And so I want them to think about what that does. But, but getting back to the idea of translation, I will have them, I have had them translate, like switch different characters. So I, you know, have Iola speak in dialect and then have Tom in, in standard English, just to see like what that does to the text and, you know, what they think she's doing with the languages, you know, sort of side by side in that book. And so those are a few of the things I, I have them think about and then I do in my classroom. So yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. And so I'll open it up a bit and, and we can kind of see where this goes. One of the things that I, I think we hadn't quite mentioned yet is code switching. And yeah. I, I, I think the idea of characters who perhaps could be able to code switch would be, I think, an interesting question here. We don't quite see that in Iola Roy, but we see in other Black literature that makes me think of this like in Peculiar Sam, you know, characters' dialect is not static. 
it moves. And so I wonder too, what, you know, what it would mean for that to, to kind of change how some individual character is, is speaking in any given moment in, in terms of what, you know, what the larger conversation and then with whom that might be, I think is an interesting point. Because as Derek says early on, which I think is really common, that like Black families might have lots of different forms of Black English, just like lots of other families have lots of different forms of, of English or other languages that sometimes bleed into one another and aren't necessarily divided in these neat boxes quite in the way that we might understand them as we see this represented in this particular way that it is, right? With none of the standard English ever kind of veering away from standard English and the dialect, you know, being pretty consistent with each character there. I'm glad you brought up the Hopkins um, example because it suggests again that, you know, trying to identify what the writer is trying to do, you know, is a static representation of character important to the particular goals of the writer, or is the writer seeking for a more fluid representation of identity as performative? And I think in Hopkins, you do get, I'm thinking of a couple of scenes in uh, Contending Forces, where a character will say, as Uncle So-and-so would say, and then give you a Black dialect sentence, which stands from the rest of the speech of that character. That is, you know, that's part of Hopkins's, you know, literary agenda to render that kind of complexity. I do think there, and this isn't a criticism, but I do think there is a, a bit of the dynamic of, of characterization in Harper has everything to do with her, the lessons she wants that book to teach and the political goals of that text. And I think you know, I'm hearing from a number of you how important it is for the students to connect what they're reading on the page with what the goals of the text and the, the narrative aims are. And I think that that would be a place to kind of talk further about that. Yeah, and I just add to that, one of the differences between Harper and Hopkins or Chestnut and others is that for Harper, like the lessons come out through the conversations like her fiction is conversationally driven. Mm -hmm. You will go through a lot of back and forth, people talking. There won't be a narrator who comes in and says, well, this is the moral of the story, as you can see from character A, B, and C. Instead, Harper will show you characters A through Z talking, and there will be a sort of uh, voice that the novel wants us to understand as a key voice Iola, for instance, mm -hmm. but even that voice is always getting constructed in conversation with other people. And so like those sounds, those code switching, who has facility with the language, however it's rendered is as important as anything else in the novel because Harper needs voices to work in this particular way. Yeah, and the thing that I find striking about everyone's comments, even though I, I think that we approach this uh, in radically different ways, is, is just the level of care that y'all are taking with the text and, and with the issue. I'm remembering what uh, Caritha Mitchell said, and I think it was an early session of maybe the Dickens Universe, but um, talking about how Harper, from the first word, right, makes demands upon her reader. She's really asking you to do a set of very specific things. And sometimes, Derek's point is well taken, sometimes she does it through saying, here's the trap. Oh, now look, I just, you know, you, you fell into that trap. Here's what you actually might want to be thinking about doing. And it, it, it seems like if we approach dialect in those ways, and this is why, Bridget, I love your bringing in the, the, the question of code switching and multiple codes, like from square one that says there is a sophistication that we need to think about within this language. And there needs to be a sophistication in the way that we approach this language, right? We can't just do it. We have to step back and think about it. And that says that we have to exercise care. I was laughing, Jennifer, about your language about the messy classroom, which also I, I favor, although it's a different kind of messy thing. But just struck by the level of care that you are taking to make the mess happen, right? That seems to me to be within the demands that Harper is putting on us by using this language and by sort of calling us to think about how we might engage with it. So I'm interested in like what the fear is in that I, a lot of you said you don't want the students to read the dialect or you don't want to put that, make that demand of them. And I would like to hear more about that. I, I understand like you don't want to embarrass them, I think is what Derek said. So, but I, I want to hear more about that since I do exactly the opposite 
And it never occurred to me not to have them read the dialogue. <laughs> it never occurred to me. So. Yeah. Um, I think it has to do with a couple of things. Go ahead, Derek. I'll let no, you go ahead. I mean, one, I, I think that the question of this for me has in many ways to do with people's own relationship to the language that's being depicted here, including my own, right? As, as you know, and I do point to like, you know, my own speech as like a, a, a form of, you know, speech that would go unmarked in this, even though like, Standard English does not represent how people pronounce words, one, you know, and, and two, like certain kinds of accents just don't get marked in that way, right? And so I tell them, like, like I sound vaguely Canadian because of where my mother is from. And so I pronounce words like borrow and sorrow and tomorrow with a long O instead of a, a short O, right? And, you know, and like, how would you write that if you wanted to write it down? And, and you know, and, and why is that not notable? <laughs> In, in, in the same way that this speech is, is notable. Some of my students, you know, in, in Wisconsin have never met a black person before they come to college, and, you know, and, and, and I think, uh, you know, also the, this, this plays into ideas about blackness that Harper, you know, in this kind of multiplicity, but that I think are, are, are not consistent with, you know, the kinds of ideas about blackness and black people in black speech and especially black southern speech that come to that that, that that people might come to the room with right so you know that black southern speech is also not just southern because the great migration was a thing that happened my grandmother was from georgia and she sounded like she was from georgia until the day mm -hmm. she died and so do some of her children even though they have never were, were, you know are not from georgia right and so and so the, the way that language you know kind of moves and I mean, is relocatable you know, and, and even beyond our ideas of language as regional, because I think the other idea of, of, of dialect as something that's regional is, is harder to, to, to get away from in, in, in their discussions. You know, I, I want to have these kinds of conversations because I do feel like, you know, the question as to who ought to represent this language and how, you know, is, is, is maybe a, a, you know, a play or something like that. I think I would think very clearly about casting. And what would it mean to cast people who are going to, you know, a different kind of separate expert question that my very introductory classes on this don't necessarily make it to. Mm -hmm. If I were teaching something on performance, then I think I would think about, you know, in, in which we were going to actually perform, you know, perform certain kinds of speech in, in different ways. And whether, you know, and that that's also complicated by Harper, by Iola, you know, and by me teaching it. You know, it is, you know, the kinds of questions that I, that I want to, you know, ask my students to, to get at, but also because we're just kind of scratching the surface with a book like this, if you're teaching it in a whole semester of other stuff, it, you know, that, that this is something that I kind of put aside as, as a different, you know, maybe level of, of, of conversation, how, and is there a way to do this responsibly, you know, I, I, I think requires a certain kind of methodological ethics question that is not necessarily the kinds of questions that I'm asking in in the very kind of introductory classes I'm I, I'm talking about genre and things like that mm -hmm. and so you know and so I, I think maybe I've just kind of set this aside as not necessarily my purview for the kinds of classes in which I teach this but you know I, I'm curious to 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 think about how, you know, how, how others think about this, especially with regard to like their own positionality in relation to this. I know Derek talked on this a bit and I think those kinds of conversations are, are important for students to like hear you work out yourself in the classroom in some way. Yeah, they're really essential. I, I, Derek, I'm sorry, you wanted to, the next, you sure? Yeah. I, I, cause I mean, I would, I would maybe add two, two strains to think about. If I, as the middle-aged bearded white professor am doing dialect, if I don't talk with my students and if I don't approach it with some caution and some real care, it's just me exercising my power in the way that white folks have done this all the way through and, and that I think Harper really, really challenges. And so I would much rather, you know, sort of highlight that the, the, the way a white teacher should do this, right, is to think about it and to talk about it and to listen to scholars and Black authors and students rather than just assuming uh, um, that because I have, uh, uh, what's what's that uh, line in uh, John Ernest's Chaotic Justice, right, that I uh, mm -hmm. got my uh, credentials, my PhD in American literature and entered African American studies only to find out that I knew nothing, that I had to re-educate myself completely, right? And so there's that just as a sort of personal sense from, from as a white teacher, but I also I also think, and I, I love the generosity, Jennifer, of, of, of recognizing that lots of white folks who are 
using specific versions of Black speech are, are trying to engage in the conversation in different ways because they find those elements of speech so much more exciting, so much more on point, so much more thoughtful and useful. But I also want those, you know, I want white speakers who are doing that to recognize that being able to do it is a real marker of privilege. You know, I, I can just do this and I can shut it off. And, and I think that if I am asking them to do dialect in those ways, there's, there's a real risk that if we don't talk about it first, they don't think about the privilege. Um, they don't think about those questions and they just assume that they can do it. And so folks laughing at me or a group of white students laughing at each other doing dialect seems to me to have a whole bunch of loaded stuff in there that we need to unpack or that we need to think about. And, and so sort of, and this is again, the sort of broader sense of, you know, think about who you are and what you get to do because of the visual and, and physical markers that you have. And, and so dialect, I think, figures figures directly into that. I'll also just throw in really quickly that I have uh, a slight stutter. I have problems with uh, T's and G's especially. And those are letters that are crucial, right, to, you know, to, to thinking about a variety of Black Englishes. And so thinking about the ways in which that mild piece of physicality can shape my speech and make me sound funny because I got mocked a lot for sounding funny when I was a kid in those ways. Again, that all sort of feeds into the ways in which we make assumptions about speech yes. and, and about what kinds of speech we're doing um, that are just so loaded with privilege. And so I, I think my real fear there, and, mm. uh, you know, and I appreciate your use to that word there, my real fear with, with doing this in my classrooms and our classrooms is that we approach it without care. We approach it as if, oh, okay, we could just do this or whatever. That yeah, I'd just add briefly, Eric brought us the word care. The word that's been coming up in my mind is, do I trust your motives or my own motives for reading these pieces in this space in this way? And what I hear, Jennifer, when you're talking about your classroom is a space where you've spent a good deal of time thinking about how to build that trust and you've shaped the classroom as a space where when the moment comes, the students already understand and trust that they're coming from a good place when they're doing this work. And that takes a lot of time and planning. And so my own stance is less about, I would suggest no one do this ever and more making sure, questioning your motives, what's the pedagogical outcome, building the trust that not only do the students in the classroom trust that they're each coming from a good place when they're trying out these ideas, et cetera, but that you, me, whomever, has built up the kind of trust through framing, context, et cetera, that we're coming from um, a good place with this. So that's one of the things I think about. And I'm also a little bit like Bridget in that I think, and I've done this with right and Hurston and others shaped entire sort of lesson plans around getting us to the point where we could try out some of the language. I just haven't done that in a class where I've taught at Ola, which tends to be larger, which gets back to the sort of building kind of cultural trust, which is a little bit more difficult <clears throat> in a large lecture than it is in a smaller survey. And also just on a purely personal level, I have been the student in those classes, whether they are sort of predominantly Black at an HBCU or where I've been one of one or two in a mainly white space. And I've been, I've experienced, I've had really bad experiences with faculty and students reading dialect or Black English or however you want to describe it. And I really don't want to put another student in that kind of position. And I take this stance not just with so sort of dialect, but also with non-standard English and all sorts of other kinds of texts, because I'm keenly aware, especially in some of the places where I've taught, where students are like bolting the class because they've been working, they're coming from a panoply of experiences, and all those experiences don't necessarily get voiced in the space, and I'm keenly aware of making sure that I don't unintentionally alienate students, which goes back to sort of my admiration for like the culture of care and trust. Jennifer, it sounds like you build in your lesson planning around this. I think an aha moment for me was in a class that had 
two African-American students. And this is ages ago before I had really sort of thought through this and, 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 and learned from a lot of folks. And I asked if anyone would read a passage aloud. And fully half of this, and the two African-American students were sitting together uh, roughly in the middle of one side of the room. And fully half of the other students turned to look at the two Black students. <laughs> Mm-hmm. as if, oh, automatically, y- you must be the expert in this. Yeah. And, and that, that's a pretty heavy weight uh, uh, to, 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 to drop on a student. And, and so that was a moment where I think we all sort of then, and uh, that was really quite dicey, we were all sort of in different ways, private conversations, but later on a large sort of classroom conversation where we said, so, you know, why do you assume this speech is this person's simply because of that one visual factor that you may actually know nothing about? I, I, but, but that's that's yeah, that's messy. That's that's risky. And 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 my worry there is I make is that's really painful for you know sometimes for 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 students that are there. Yeah. I, I, yeah, and I appreciate all of that. And I think being a Black professor mitigates a little of that because it becomes, because I am the authority in the classroom and because I set the tone and because there's a level of trust there that comes from my just looking like them, it does make some of these moves a little bit easier. But yes, I've been the student I, I, that you're saying that I that was called on to sing a spiritual when we were uh, studying William Styron's The Confessions of Nat Turner I didn't know spirituals and I can't sing, but yes, I've been in that position. But it's amazing how we can do one tiny thing as a teacher that is just so destructive. Well, you know, it wasn't, I didn't feel as being destructive because I was, I was too self-aware at that point for it to be destructive. I thought it was odd. Right. (laughs) And I just said, no, (laughs) and I left it behind, but yes, it can be very, very destructive and very uncomfortable and it can, it can carry uh, through one's education if you are sensitive in that, in that way. Absolutely. One of the things that strikes me uh, um, coming out of all these comments that might be relevant for the, the Dickens universe is, you know, you know, Afro-American literature is not the only literature that has dialects. And, you know, I think if nothing else, the takeaway should be um, the pedagogical goals to make the students as self-aware as possible about their own practice, about you know what they're reading, why they're reading it, and what the writers are doing. But I would hope that people would see that some of these issues are portable. In other words, you know, I I, I don't teach Ila Leroy in 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 a, in a class where I'm teaching primarily non-black writers, but I do teach uh, black writers who use dialect, and I will move from there to a text that has Jewish dialect, if you want to call it that or a text by um, a Mexican-American writer where there is clearly an attempt to render accented English. And I think, you know, trying to let the students see that these are broad issues and that the self-awareness, and I like the idea of humility and care, you know, really opens the door to a broader conversation around, you know, speech and how we read individuals through perceived speech. And so shifting it off of sometimes just the African-American experience mm-hmm. can be useful at, at diffusing some of some of these issues. But mm-hmm. this has all been really, really, really productive. Um, you know, on that note, I used to teach Gavin Jones's book uh, uh, when I would teach mm-hmm. dialect. And I think he, he's, I can't remember the name of this book, mm-hmm. but he's making that argument about how, you know, how prevalent dialect work was in newspapers and literature mm-hmm. in the 19th century. And so to contextualize it within his scholarship, I think would also be very productive. I mean, I think it's interesting how how Iola Leroy offers a kind of clear site for exploring these kinds of issues, you know, just just as itself, right? In that opening, you know, that dispels these kind of stereotypes about who talks in dialect and why in, in you know, in the kind of multiple, you know, renderings of Black English there in, in all the things that Iola herself has to has to learn about. <laughs> Black people Mm -hmm. in general. And over the course of of this novel, she has some really questionable uh, understanding of this at the the outset. Um, 
and you know and how readers are kind of brought along this you know that this path with you know both Iola's development and how the novel kind of plays out in, in a way that I think fairly forces you know these kinds of conversations are, are around this book you know in, in a way that you know I think also you know demands that we bring all kinds of historicist you know contextualization into you know the the understanding of you know of, of what's going on here here, here too, but but also in its, you know, not just extension to other realms, but also its persistence, right? And so it, it, it's one of the things that students will find relevant in, you know, in thinking about conversations about African-American vernacular English and, you know, in, in, in different spaces and especially online spaces where we're absented from the RL often, you know, in a, in a, I guess I'm thinking of a pre-TikTok era, you know, especially in, 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 in you know, particularly written forms and in thinking about, you know, you know, what, what is and isn't, a, 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 you know, appropriate and appropriated, you know, who, who gets to, you know, write, write in what ways, you know, they'll, they'll lead them into conversations about authorship, you know, and, and representation, you know, kind of more broadly when we can start to talk about Harper, you know, and, and I think that like it, it, that this, because there's maybe because there's so much going on in, in text like this, that it lends itself well to, you know, kind of variety of methodological interventions that are then applicable to lots of different places. This has been really useful. Yeah, we've gone over time. So if there's any, take, you know, any last thoughts, you know, maybe in the, in the, along the lines of, you know, what, what we might think of as, you know, the kind of guiding principles for this conversation, you know, care and, and attention seems to be one that, that folks are talking about a lot. Are, are there other guiding principles that we could locate and that we might share? I would stress that idea, and I'm, I know I'm stealing it uh, from Eric, the idea of this humility in the face of, you know, what the unfamiliar in these texts. And to just assume that we, there's homework to be done of all kinds in, in terms of responsibly approaching and appreciating these types of narrative literary strategies. And I think it's the, what, what's, what's, what can be uh, awkward to offensive <laughs> is <laughs> of people not approaching it with the kind of care again, but humility. I mean, that, that there's, there's, there's a world <laughs> underneath, there's a world of culture underneath a lot of these moments in these texts and uh, they're complicated and fraught and they need to be engaged as, as best as the individual can do. But yeah, to, do, to be willing to do the homework. I would say to not be afraid of laughter, that laughter yeah, can be um, yeah. very instructive yeah. and useful in the classroom. Yeah. yeah. And I'd also like to, you know, to think to to think and, and, and be clear about, you know, what is what what you know what it is we're laughing at in mm -hmm. the in this, right? Mm -hmm. And and so so there's a difference between, you know, laugh, laughing at ourselves and our our, our 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 perhaps lack of knowledge, you know, or an ability to to render this like just the basic inability to render this language into something that we can understand, comprehend. Like reading comprehension is a hard problem with reading texts like this, right? But that that laughter, you know, is 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 divorced from the characters that, that Harper's mm -hmm. writing who are doing very, very different things, you know, beyond the comic and that. And that there are systems at work there. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll steal, right, Richard, one of your, you know, initial points is, is you know, that, that, that there are specific typographic conventions that are developed in the 19th century that sometimes have nothing to do with what the oral sounded like and sometimes have nothing to do with uh, what black speech, uh, how black speech functioned. And oftentimes were developed by folks who were as far away from black communities as, as, as you can imagine. And so thinking about who gets to make the systems and what the systems then sort of do to the, to the, to the page and, and then do to our work with the page d demands that kind of intentionality that, that, that all of you have so, so thoughtfully articulated. Yeah. This has yeah. been so fun, Bridget. Thank you. I'd just add briefly the why and the for whom. We've okay. all largely been talking about a classroom setting, largely undergraduates, uh, which is a pretty controlled space with a lot of work that each of us can put into the staging of a moment. And so really thinking carefully and critically about the why and I had taken the approach I'm taking and the for whom who will have access to this under what context et cetera, it's critical to exercising that care and building the trust, I think. So yeah, thanks everyone, this has been fun.
Thank you all so much for this conversation. I think it's a really, really great glimpse into the kind of long history of conversations around this topic, you know, both inside this, in this particular text and beyond it, including the plethora of literature that becomes before, comes before and after that has been mentioned here. That really helps, I think, situate Harper's novel in kind of broad, rich history of African-American literature and culture and people who have been thinking about this and who can, you know, are still continuing to wrestle with, you know, the complexities of, of this work. So thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And bye-bye.